Okay, so thank you uh, for the organizers, I mean, for giving <coughs> me the opportunity of uh, speaking a little bit about my uh, interests. Um, so what I sh uh, should say at the beginning is that um, I was designing this talk as yes, uh, um, trying to focus more on the historical background of the area, um, the evolution, of course, in time, and some, uh, I would say, important tools uh, and representative problems. And uh, I won't insist too much on real my, my uh, research topics. It's not so much time for that. And of course, I would be happy uh, um, if further anyone would be interested to discuss in more details, then uh, it would be very nice. Um, so um, it's, yes, I mean, the title, it's uh, um, some aspects in time frequency analysis. So I should first start, of course, saying that time frequency analysis, it's a subfield uh, of harmonic analysis, um, which itself harmonic analysis may be thought at least for the beginning. I mean, I don't know how, how can I define these days harmonic analysis, but at least initially, yes, it was the um, um, branch of mathematics which was uh, uh, um, studying uh, the um, decomposition of objects, I mean, in terms of superposition of elementary uh, objects. So you think at a function, and you try to, to organize this function in terms of elementary building blocks. And uh, um, the theory which um, harmonic analysis is, could have been seen as, as uh, uh, the investigation and further generalization of, if you want, Fourier series, if you think on the uh, uh, on Z, on the, the discrete setting, setting, or the Fourier transform uh, over the real line. Um, well, in physics, uh, often these functions are called signals, and these elementary building blocks are called uh, waves or harmonics, uh, hence the name of harmonic analysis. Um, <coughs> good, so uh, both the f then field as, it's, as a whole, yes, harmonic analysis, and this particular subfield, time frequency analysis, uh, had its origin uh, in the study of, uh, of Fourier about the heat equation. And uh, in his study, uh, I think in 1809, um, he was uh, solving the heat equation by uh, <coughs> basically <coughs> proposing to decompose a function f in this in so such elementary building blocks, yes, sum over k, say, in z of what's called the Fourier coefficient fk times exponential ikx, yes, where f can be initially thought as a function of the torus. We'll specify a little bit, of course, in what condition this makes sense, yes, and each fk, yes, are called the free coefficient of, of order k associated with the function f. Yes, if you look on the torus, you can think them as integral from 0 to 1 of f of x exponential minus i or minus 2 pi i kx dx. Now, uh, understanding in what sense this formula has a meaning, uh, yes, um, actually, was a, a serious challenge for the math community. I mean, trying to be rigorous and, and specifying what they understand by associating to a function, it's really serious. So if you put here an equality sign, in what sense this equality uh, uh, is, makes sense, and for what kind of objects, I mean, well-behaving objects, this has a, a meaning. Uh, and so um, this, again, uh, brought, uh, uh, um, I mean, a series of, of, I mean, a good mathematics involved. And it was at the origin, I would say, of, um, say, Lebesgue uh, theory of integration. Um, after that, um, the study of the Hilbert transform, which was in connection, as we'll see, with, again, the behavior of this free series, uh, served as a model for caldron zygmunt theory. And third, it was also at the origin of the subfield in which I'm working, time frequency analysis. So very briefly, um, why, I mean, to mention at each point uh, in what sense I'm referring. So first of all, the back theory of integration. Well, <coughs> uh, yes, first, of course, people were interested, uh, yes, to make a meaning of this equality relation. And uh, yes, again, to see uh, for what class of well-behaving objects this equality makes sense. Um, initially, um, I mean, it was supposed that, for example, if you take a, a good enough function, say a continuous function, 
you'll have that a such a continuous function can be represented uh, yes, in such a sum. It came as a surprise when uh, uh, de Bois-Rimond in uh, 1873 actually provided uh, an example of a continuous function whose free series uh, uh, diverges in the set of rational points. So uh, it was uh, um, um, clear at that moment that this equality sign, I mean, needs to be understood in a, a different, uh, I mean, has to have a m different meaning. So you cannot uh, uh, can understand the equality everywhere, but maybe except to some, uh, I mean, some set. And this, yes, I mean, there are serious investigation on this topic and farther, I mean, in, I think, 1905, Lebec uh, found this theory about integration and basically uh, uh, sort of set the problem in the correct uh, uh, um, sort of environment. So you should regard this equality as almost everywhere. So you throw away an exceptional set and you hope that on the complement of that exceptional set, <coughs> this equality holds. Um, now, why Caldron Zygmunt theory? Um, so even after this setting was presented, uh, yes, I mean, okay, we speak about now equality almost everywhere, still this problem uh, uh, was extremely challenging. And even though there were sorts of partial progress for some special cases of functions, I mean, some in some classes of, of, there are still not, I mean, not sort of a, a clear advance. And then the people moved a little bit the, the weight in terms of understanding this equality, not uh, almost everywhere, but norm-wise. So if you take now, yes, uh, at the second point, yes. So if you think now on the Lebesgue space spaces LP on the, the torus, yes, with P, say, between 1 and infinity, a natural question was, well, if I have the partial Fourier sums, yes, the partial operator, yes, as sum from k equal minus n to n of the Fourier coefficient fk times e to the i k x, is it true? that the partial Fourier sums converge in the LP uh, norm to F, as n goes to infinity, yes. Uh, by a sort of universal principle, you can transform this kind of qualitative uh, uh, statements, yes, convergence into quantitative statements about boundness of some operators. So it proves, it turns out that this question is equivalent with showing that this operator, yes, it's bounded by the uh, norm of f in the LP norm, yes, for any n. And farther on, this turns out to be equivalent with showing that the Hilbert transform associated to the function f, it's actually bounded. When I'm writing this, I'm referring that up to a constant that I won't specify it, yes? So if you want, you can just say a small equal than a constant depending on p, universal constant times the f function f in the norm LP, yes? Where the Hilbert transform now, is defined as, if you want, the principal value from minus 1 over 2 to 1 over 2 of um, the function fx minus y cotangent of pi y dy. Uh, yes, and this was a, a theorem, a deep theorem of Marcel Ries in 1928, which actually showed uh, that this statement is correct. So the Hilbert transform is bounded from LP to LP, hence, indeed, the Fourier series converges to the function f in LP. So at least this kind of equality makes sense for functions in LP as long as you refer to that equality in, in the sense of, of norm convergence. Uh, farther on, this Hilbert transform um, served as a prototype uh, of singular integral uh, for Calderon and Zygmunt, which farther, I think around 50s, they developed the theory which, but which, is, which is called nowadays uh, Calderon-Zygmunt theory. Yes, about singular integrals, and it's very useful in PD. And further, the last question, yes, three, why time frequency analysis? Um, so, of course, coming back now to the initial question, in what sense this equality makes sense, yes, I mean, and not now norm-wise, but really almost everywhere, yes, um, losing, uh, I think in 1913, he conjectured that um, for a function f in L2 of the torus, you should have that Sn of f of x converges to f of x almost everywhere x. Um, well, farther on, in 1922, um, Kolmogorov 
uh, provided uh, count, I mean, uh, provided uh, uh, the following uh, 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 theorem. So he showed that actually for a function which is now in L1 of the torus, so only L1 integrable, you actually, so you can find a function in L1 such that the, uh, its uh, partial Fourier sums diverges almost everywhere. Hence, it was thought that maybe uh, refining a little bit more Komogorov example, actually one may be able to disprove uh, uh, a losing conjecture about uh, pointwise convergence to the Fourier series. Um, and many times, actually, people uh, uh, try to, to, to uh, um, find counterexamples for that. And 40 years later, uh, in 66, Carlesson actually um, proved that losing conjecture is true. So indeed, for any function in L2, you have that the par partial free sums converge to, converges to L uh, almost everywhere. And later, Hunt uh, uh, proved that actually this is true for any function in LP. as long as p is between 1 and infinity. Now, the tools involved in uh, this uh, um, deep proof of Carlesson uh, were the tools which were at the foundation of uh, time frequency analysis. Um, good. Now, to enter a little bit more in, in, in so to speak a little bit more in details about um, this, uh, what I would like to say. So, both the Hilbert transform and what we'll see, the Carlesson operator, are uh, operators which have um, kernels which have singularities. So basically, the kernel uh, um, blows up in, in some region of the space and also has some uh, um, uh, oscillation. So uh, the whole idea of the proof should be you need to understand very well that the properties of the kernel and try to split that operator uh, into a sum of smaller operators which are well localized, whatever that means. I mean, you, you need to have basically good uh, uh, um, um, support in both space uh, and frequency and uh, to control the oscillation of that piece. And after that, uh, the hope is to try to bound these small pieces little by little, form families of such uh, 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 small pieces for which you obtain a good control. And finally, to find criteria, depending on which you can glue all these pieces together for obtaining a bound for the global operator. Yeah, so this would be the general idea. Again, I mean, always you see this, this uh, sort of light motif, looking at a, at a complicated object, decomposing in sort of smaller and elementary uh, building blocks, obtaining, I mean, letting that those pieces to interact in a nice manner, and after that, obtaining the, m moving again the problem to the initial case, yes, by transferring the bounds from that building, elementary building box to the initial one. Um, so what means well localized? Well, <clears throat> we'll move now into the setting on, on the real line. So suppose we are taking now a function, which is a Schwarz function. So yes, it has, uh, it's smooth and it has a, a, a rapid decay at infinity. And um, yes, you expect yes to be behave something like this, say, a function of, of this type. And what you see is that morally, yes, you will see a region in the space in which your function is focused. It's basically most of the information carried by this function, it's localized say, in this interval, yes. And on the other hand, you will have some oscillation of this function, yes, for which you also need somehow to take in account this oscillation, yes. You want to be able to make a distinction between such a function and same function which has, which has the same space localization, but it's ba basically with no oscillation. And here uh, it comes to, to help you the free transform, which has this very beautiful property that uh, it moves oscillation, uh, yes, if you look at the oscillation for the function f, its Fourier transform, yes, f hat, will act on this oscillation by basically moving the support of that function uh, for, the, for the f hat. So basically, what I'm trying to say now is that this oscillation will be encoded if, first of all, the Fourier transform maps the Schwarz function, yes, so the Fourier transform maps s of r into s of r, so it will be of a function of the same type, and um, the oscillation of this function will be basically encoded in the uh, support of, uh, moral support of the function f hat, yes? So you'll see another function here of the same type, yes, having now uh, most of the information focused in some region of, of the space. 
Um, so this is for f hat, say, j, this is i for f. Now, um, you can sort of put this information together, so in make a, a sort of a, a picture in which you encode both the localization of your function f and the oscillation of that function f that uh, basically translates in the support of the function f hat into a single picture by drawing yes, a, a coordinate system in which on this axis you'll put uh, the space uh, value of your function f, yes, which in physics is called time. And on this coordinate, you'll put the frequency. This comes from physics, which refers actually to the Fourier side, Fourier information carried by f hat. So basically, you'll take the interval i coming from the function f here. You'll put it on this axis, i. You'll take now the interval j here from f hat. You'll put it, put it correspondingly on this axis, where whatever, whenever, I mean, whatever position it is. And correspondingly, yes, you'll obtain a rectangle, yes, which supposedly will carry actually what's the essential part of the information carried by the function. So the support of the function and the oscillation of the function. Yeah? And this is called, yes, the time frequency representation of your object f. Um, now, of course, ideally you'd like this uh, uh, localization to be as good as possible, but there is a restriction that applies, namely that, again, heuristically, if you want, if you take now a function, uh, say, which is log, uh, supported smooth, nicely behaving, between 1 over n and 2 to the power n, so this is your function f, yes, and you ask yourself how big can you, I mean, or when the Fourier transform of f becomes small. So you are looking at f hat of c, yes, which is just the integral over r of f of x exponential minus i x c dx, yes? Well, for seeing, I mean, for, for obtaining the f hat to be small, you need to see some cancellation inside. And some cancellation inside, you cannot be able to see it if that exponential, yes, has a period which is basically larger than the uh, um, support of the function f. So for being able to see that cancellation, you need actually to have the exponential to oscillate faster enough yes, inside of the support of uh, your function. So basically, you need the period of the function to be less than 1 over n, which expresses equivalently with saying that c should be greater than n, yes? which is equivalent to saying that if you want to look at f hat to be small enough, then basically you want the support of f hat, the moral support of f hat, yes, so where, again, most of the information is uh, 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 located to be greater or equal than 1 over the support um, of the moral support of the function f. So basically you obtain now informally yes, what's called the Heisenberg principle, namely that the support of the function f times the support of the function f hat, it's always greater or equal than a universal constant. This expresses in terms of this picture that you can never actually, yes, ideally you would like this concentration to be basically localized in a single point. That's not possible, yes? You'll always have the area of this rectangle uh, greater or equal, say, than one. Good. Uh, another manifestation of this, all that I uh, said to you, uh, it can be seen through, uh, yes, looking at, yes, this key relation, yes, Parseval relation. Uh, so the fact that the scalar product of fg is equal with the scalar product of f hat g hat, and basically, when you ask when such an interaction is small, uh, you equivalently you'll say that either basically the support of f is far from the support of g, or the fact that f oscillates against g and you see some cancellation. But this will translate through this duality formula in the fact that the support of f hat should be far enough from the support of g hat. Yes. So basically, in terms of this uh, sort of uh, draw representation uh, formula, you will see that uh, uh, you expect such a scalar product to be small when you have the time frequency representation of the function f and the time frequency representation of the function g, yes, there are two boxes which are far away one from the other. And when these two boxes overlap, yes, you expect this car product to be, I mean, big. Oops. OK, so it's, I thought I would be able to say more. But um, um, OK, so. Uh, what can I say then? Um, the point is that using this representation, um, you can now transfer uh, sort of all this story in pictures, yes, uh, for the 
both the Hilbert transform or what's called the Cal or, or the Callison operator, and um, uh, you can basically decompose these operators in uh, family of operators which are now very well localized in space and in frequency. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, I'm afraid that I won't be able to, to say too much about that. So, um, I apologize. Okay, so I think I think it's better than just to to okay state then probably the problem with which I with which I was uh, thinking uh, um, on I mean the problem of my thesis and then probably to mention some open problems. I apologize. It's it's uh, already twenty minutes uh, uh, past. Okay, so my, the problem of my thesis was actually so. I was speaking to you about the, the uh, almost everywhere convergence of the Fourier series. Um, yes, and it turns out that, uh, again, I was mentioning to you that these qualitative problems can be awfully rephrased in terms of, qu of, of, of quantitative problems. So proving that uh, the partial Fourier uh, operator Sn of, of x goes to f of x almost everywhere, yes, for a function, say, in L2, this turns out to be equivalent with studying the properties of this maximal operator, which is the supremum over n greater or equal than 1 of the partial free sums Sn of x. Yes. So basically, if you denote this with S star, say, of f, it's enough to prove that S star, for example, it's bounded from L2 of the torus to, say, L2 infinity of the torus. That would be still enough. It turns out that actually this maximal operator which is called the Callison operator, it's bounded from actually LP to LP, strongly bounded for any P between 1 and infinity. Uh, you can rewrite sort of in a, a better manner this uh, problem. Uh, and this operator, yes, as if you want, if you transfer it on the real line, you can think it as this supremum over all A real of the integral, the principal value of the integral over R of exponential A Y f of y, x minus y dy. So basically what you see here, you see if you ignore this factor, this is nothing else, and the supremum in front, of course, this is nothing else than the Hilbert transform. And now you take the Hilbert transform and you modulate it and take the supremum over all these modulations. So basically this Carlson operator, it's nothing else than MC, can be regarded as the supremum over C in R of MC H mc star, where mc it's the modulation transformation, yes, mc applied to a function f of x is exponential i c x times f of x. Um, and um, this operator has a series of, of symmetries, yes, from the Hilbert transform, it's translation dilation, uh, commutative translation and, 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 and dilation, and it has obviously from this formulation, it has a, a, a mod, uh, it's, it's invent under modulation. So C applied to any MC is just the Callison operator C. And you'll need, if you apply these time frequency methods, you'll need to make a decomposition of this operator which obeys these kind of symmetries. Now the problem in my thesis was uh, um, concerning now a question raised by uh, Professor Stein. Um, so extending this Callison operator, um, yes, instead of having a linear phase here, now um, you have what's called the generalized Callison operator. So you have now the supremum. And here you'll put now um, all the polynomials in, in uh, say, a set QD, which, which is nothing else than the set of, say, all the polynomials with real coefficients having the degrees more equal than D. And you take now, I mean, the obvious extension exponential I P of Y over X minus, uh, over Y times f of x minus y dy. And of course, the question was if one can prove similar bounds uh, for this operator, so basically extending the Callison theorem. And um, I was uh, basically able to answer to uh, this question, at least not for the full range, but uh, the question was, of course, if this Callison operator, uh, it's bounded from LP to LP for any p between 1 and infinity, and I was able to prove that for p between 1 and 2. Um, and um, finally, uh, what I would say, it's, um, there are some very interesting open problems in, in this area. Um, I will just mention two of them. 
So uh, one, it's in connection. So um, one, it's in connection with uh, the behavior of the Callison operator, the classical Callison operator, but near L1. So uh, is it true that the Callison operator, so it's known that the Hilbert transform doesn't map L1 into L1, but uh, rather L1, uh, uh, L1, L log L. So the Hilbert transform is mapping L log L into L1, yes? Um, now, the question is, is the Callison operator obeys the same relation? So is it true that the Callison operator maps L log L into L? Yes, this will be the first question. And there is some progress on this question. Uh, I think the best result up to date is uh, that the Kaiser operator maps L log L log 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 three times L into L. Yes, but nobody actually, it's actually really close of, of proving this. Um, and a second question concerns um, the, the um, different uh, aspect of the bilinear operators. So um, if you have. Uh, what's called the bilinear Hilbert transform. Yes, so take two object, uh, um, two functions fg and form this operator. Um, now, uh, it was proven by Lacey and Thiele uh, in '97 that actually this operator uh, maps Lp uh, cross Lq into Lr where you have that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal with 1 over r, you need to impose uh, pq greater than 1. And uh, this was called the Calderon conjecture. And they proved uh, that this operator is indeed obeying these uh, uh, properties, but to a restriction, namely r greater than 2 over 3. And uh, as you can see, basically, if you put impose the condition pq greater than 1, uh, basically, this means that r is allowed to, to go till 1 over 2. So there is this gap in the range between 1 over 2 and 2 over 3, which uh, it's not covered. And this will be, again, an interesting question to, to uh, ask in terms of multilinear operators and time frequency analysis. There are many other problems. The trilinear Hilbert transform or the pointwise convergence of the Schrodinger uh, solution to the initial data. But I think I won't have time to speak about that. So far. <laughs>